welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 203, featuring a retrospective of a certain indie role-playing game from Jay Barnson, aka Rampant Coyote, namely Frayed Knight's Skull of Smackdown. Now, this is a 2011 game. It's been on my list forever of uh, games to uh, review on the show, so I'm finally getting around to it now. I've played it all the way through, so I'm in a pretty good position, I think, to uh, give you a, a taste of the gameplay and my, my thoughts on its design. Anyway, it's a great game. We've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, do. Here is Frayed Knights Skull of Smackdown. And here we go with Frayed Knights the Skull of Smackdown. Little game by my good friend Jay Barnson, aka the Rampant Coyote. I think he did this yeah, back in 2011. Now I interviewed Jay, as you probably know if you keep up with the show. I guess that's been maybe a year ago. And you can go back and look at those. I'll see if I can remember to post a link. But anyway, when I interviewed Jay, I had played maybe the first level or two of this. So I thought it was time to go back and play through the whole thing. Especially since he wants uh, me, he's been asking uh, me actually to come up with some dungeon ideas for his new Frayed Knights game. So <laughs> I kind of thought it might be a little bit important to actually check out the first game in detail. Alright, so the, as you can see here, the uh, you don't create your own characters which I guess is kind of a bummer for some people, but the uh, the upswing of that is you get uh, the, at least the uh, developer, the designer, gets to create some pretty good personalities for the characters, gets to develop a whole storyline around the characters. It'd be kind of hard to do that if you didn't make them yourself. You just let the player make whatever he wanted. Uh, well, you know, what if I wanted to make four Chloes? <laughs> be a completely different kind of game. Uh, movement, pretty much what you would expect. You can do a little uh, sachet there. If you would like a strafing kind of move, uh, really this is not this is only going to matter when it's you're moving around the dungeons. Uh, the combat, you're you're stuck in place, uh, so it's not quite like uh, the Might and Magic. Was it six, seven? Uh, that it's, it's kind of what this game reminds me of the most, although the combat is very different. As you can see, there's quite a bit of dialogue uh, between well, I guess among uh, the characters there. They can change their facial expressions. Depending on, I guess, their their mood. Uh, so there's a bit of a storytelling apparatus there. It's kind of cool. A lot of these uh, crates here at the beginning. You know, you know what this game, the, sort of the vibe of this game, uh, to me is not so much a serious adventure as it is a bunch of guys, sort of witty, uh, funny guys. Maybe they've had a few brews. Uh, sitting around playing Dungeons and Dragons, the, the old tabletop game, and, and kind of having a lot of fun with it, kind of, you know, uh, picking with the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master's kind of picking with the players. There's a lot of teasing going on, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, definitely a different vibe uh, than you'd get with uh, something uh, darker, more serious, like the uh, aforementioned Wizardry or Might and Magic series. I guess I should mention, too, just in case you don't know the story of this game, it is an indie RPG, so it's pretty much a one-man band. He did have, uh, I think, some helpers. I forget how many people actually helped him out with this. A couple of good friends, probably. Uh, so it's pretty much a uh, labor of love. Okay, here we go. This is a turn-based combat engine, which I think I've probably said about 60 times already. <laughs> so we're fighting these vicious pus golems. Thank you, Jay, for that. Uh, one cool thing about this, it keeps a journal for you. There's a spell that you can use to fill this out. There's even a skill you can get later on uh, to fill this out for you. But you can get some information about the critters that you're fighting. Hopefully you'll see some damage modifiers in there, which lets you know what their weaknesses are. So it's kind of a cool thing. You don't always just want to use the same spells, the same weapons, you know, critter after critter. Uh, you want to switch up depending on the, the type of monster it is. You get a pretty good advantage. Just looking at some of the uh, the help screens. Uh, although it seems at first they're kind of giving you all this information is going to be a, an easy game. This is actually <laughs> brutally difficult. Uh, you can, you'll can you probably end up reloading at least once or twice just doing this first intro dungeon. Uh, I, know, I know I did. <laughs> Alright, there's uh, one pus column. I'll try to give you some more information on how this combat works as we go. Basically, though, it works as you would expect. You've got a priest here that can cast uh, healing spells, and you can put some... He's got modifying type spells. Uh, the mage, Chloe, wizard, sorcerer, whatever you want to call her. I think it's called sorcery in this game. And she's got mostly damaging spells. She can also speed up characters, which is uh, pretty nice. She also has, a, I think, a blurry form spell. Uh, and then the, I guess the most innovative part of this engine is this concept of drama stars. So the idea with those is it's sort of special perks that you get along the way. Uh, a lot of the times they can 
uh, save your uh, save your butt when you get in over your head. And they just uh, they accrue, I guess, with combats, uh, picking locks. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly what all makes these things generate, but when you get enough of them, you can perform some uh, pretty cool things. And they don't save with you when you save your game and load it load it up again. So, I guess the idea there is uh, trying to encourage you not to uh, keep saving and reloading, but you know, just keep keep it keep it going, which I think is good. Although I have to say, I still <laughs> ended up having to reload quite a bit. All right, the health, endurance, and exhaustion. Okay, so you see the red bar, of course, is your health. But then that blue bar there is your endurance. And if that runs out, then your characters will have to rest, basically not do anything for a couple of rounds. And also, uh, they'll take more damage or they won't be able to block as well. So what you really want to get in the habit of doing is resting and... Uh, you have a spell, too, that can rest you. You can also rest, rest yourself in between bouts in combat, which is nice. The only problem is the exhaustion, that little yellow bar, will continue to drop. And eventually, even, no matter how much you rest inside the dungeons, you'll, it'll just be a tiny little sliver of rest, and then your characters will be tired. So, Basically, you have to trudge all the way back to town to go to a bed and sleep in an inn. But, you know, kind of new to that, I guess, with RPGs. All right, here's a couple of cultists. These guys look pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty bad shape. <laughs> Not the best complexions, that's for sure. Now, going in here, looking at some of my spells. Of course, uh, as you go along, you get better spells. But even at the beginning, you get some pretty cool things. You can try to immobilize one of the mobs uh, with a uh, invoke snoring. Which... You know, I have to say another irritating thing is it seems like you miss every character. Just uh, miss, miss, you miss all the time. Monsters hardly ever miss you. <laughs> I see that, <laughs> but my God, you can't you can't hit them with a spell. About half the time you miss, uh, and I wasn't able ever able to really prevent that completely. I, it does get better with if you level it up. Uh, you know, as you level up, but still expect to miss quite a bit. Okay, I got one cultist left here. Now, the, if your character gets in, incapacitated, it's not that big of a deal. She's not dead. All I have to do is uh, go back to the inn and rest, and then she'll come back full strength. Or I can uh, take a potion. I don't think it works in combat, but after the combat, I can give her a potion to bring her back. So basically, I think what happened, there's a lot of stuff in here that's designed to make you play the game longer. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's going to take quite a while to finish this just because of all the running back to town. And uh, there's no spell that I was able to find that would just instantly zap you back there, which it would have been really cool. Okay, man, I'm starting to think I'm not going to survive this <laughs> very early battle. <laughs> oh, man, I just barely made it with two characters left. Okay, so oh, that's, that's a nice little gesture. So We get to use one of our... Drama points. So that's why it was so hard. It was by design. <laughs> okay. I can uh, bring one back with this. And I think I have a potion I can use on the other one. But as you can see, suffice it to say, this is not going to be a cakewalk. Especially at these early levels. You're definitely going to be uh, taking your time. You know, if I have, a, if you'll permit me a little bit of a, a, a side note here. That word cakewalk. Recently found out that that has a kind of a negative connotation to it. I guess I probably shouldn't use it anymore. It goes back to the slavery days in the Deep South where these uh, plantation owners every so often would put on what they, a big sort of festival dance uh, for the slaves and there'd be lots of music and the slaves would dance. I guess the male slaves would dance with each other. It's kind of a comedy thing. And uh, who, whichever couple won this would get an enormous cake. You know, this is the cakewalk. And I guess the slaves kind of saw this as their off day, their fun day, <laughs> cakewalk day. And so that's, you know, if something was really tough, of course that wouldn't be a cakewalk. You know, that's, this is your regular slave day, not your cakewalk day. So you got to be aware of these sort of connotations sometimes, I, I guess. All right, here we go. Pus, more pus golems. <laughs> run away, run away. <laughs> yeah. You know, Jay uh, Barnson must be a huge Monty Python fan because there is just loads of Monty Python references in, all throughout this game. Probably uh, have a little drinking game where you do a shot every time you see a Monty Python reference. And you'd be quite intoxicated by the end of it. 
I think it's interesting when I was playing this game to really think about the concept of, of an indie RPG uh, and what that means exactly. And you know what that sort of the, if you will, the rhetorical rationale behind using a term like that to describe your game is it is the idea that we're supposed to overlook problems with the interface or we're supposed to uh, you know forgive things be a little bit more forgiving a little bit more accepting uh, since we have to be aware that it was made obviously with a lower budget <laughs> pretty much in people's spare time uh, or is it kind of a mark of pride like a, like an indie label on if you have a band that you describe as an indie band uh, you know, the idea, you're kind of doing something different than the mainstream, something that may not, maybe it's intentionally not supposed to be commercially successful. Uh, you don't really care about that. You want to be independent from those big labels and all of the, you know, the brouhaha that goes with them. I think in this case, we get a bit of the, a bit of both of that. I mean, clearly this, it seems like everybody in the grandma now is making a turn-based RPG. I guess they've been watching Match Chat and they kept hearing me say over and over again how badly I wanted this <laughs> turn-based style. Now, obviously, I'm not the only one. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that's a, that's something right there that you would never see out of Activision or, or Blizzard or uh, uh, Bethesda, you know, because there's no demand for it. You know, they, they don't see a demand. So I think that's sort of the positive way to look at this indie um, aspect of the game. We're doing things that wouldn't be in a Bethesda game. Um, on the other hand, there are quite a few problems, and uh, the reviewers have more or less uh, accepted these. It's kind of a pain to cast spells. You have to go through several clicks, and uh, there are bugs, as we'll see here in a minute. <laughs> uh, some of them are real show showstoppers. Uh, but for the most part, though, I'm just really amazed at what uh, Jay has achieved here. You know, I, I've designed a few games myself, and they were just tiny little... I mean, by comparison, uh, molecular size games compared to this. But even still, it took me uh, many months, pretty much waking up in the morning. I, you know, I did these in the summer. So I used to wake up in the morning and work on this thing continuously all day long and late into the night even. And just for that. So when you really, if, you know, and I encourage everyone to design a little game on, of your own. Maybe just a little part of a game, you know, just, just get a little get a little bit of experience with that side of it. Because uh, after that, you're just going to see, you're going to appreciate games on a whole new level. Because you start to realize, uh, like, none of this stuff just got here. You know, Jay and his team had to sit there and make every little decision, put every little text, every little character <laughs> of the text into the game, decide where it's going to go. I mean, this, this all takes a just incredible amount of time. So the fact that he was able actually to complete this, hey, <laughs> personally, I'm willing to overlook a few extra clicks in a uh, when a cast in a spell. I think you should too. Obviously, it's, there's going to be it's not going to have that sort of slick, polished uh, feel uh, of a game where they've had uh, a budget for you know hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, people to work on it, test it, uh, go back, change it up. You know, you know, even if you play World of Warcraft, you'll notice that they're constantly having to patch that thing and make little adjustments, try to keep all the gameplay uh, balanced. So I can imagine it must just be a gargantuan task, you know, even for a small team. Especially when you have as many spells and as abilities and weapons in this. One thing I, I got, I think the best dungeon in the game, my, my favorite dungeon is probably this, this first one. <laughs> it's probably a good thing that they put it first. It looks the best. Uh, they really did a good job, I think, with the lighting on it. It's, it's suitably creepy. Definitely reminds, it, it, this game brings me back to the early 90s and playing games like Might and Magic 6 and 7. I love that that series, that, that era, the whole era, actually. Uh, I personally don't really care for the the sameness of a game like uh, Skyrim, where everything's snow, snow, and more snow. <laughs> you know, here you get quite a bit of variety. It just shows uh, there's just no excuse for that Skyrim snow world. When uh, even one guy pretty much can, <laughs> his own can make a, a much more interesting game world. Okay, so somewhere in there, there's I think a hidden, a hidden thing. But as you can see, I can no longer move. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> uh, somehow, every now and then, it just uh, freezes up on you. You can't move. So thankfully, you can just save it, and then when you come back, you'll be able to to move again. So. 
Not quite sure what happened there. How that managed to slip through quality control. But there it is. So, in other words, and also notice that sometimes your save games won't load. They just keep crashing. So, you want to get in the habit, uh, again, like in the early 90s, of uh, making several different saves <laughs> as you go along. <laughs> Try to label them. Uh, just in case the worst case scenario and you not only get stuck, but you can't even reload your save game. So you got to be very careful in that regard. All right, we're back in action. Now, if you can search, I think, with X, the only problem with it is it uh, will bring a spawn random encounters pretty frequently if you do it. So <laughs> you kind of have to trade off. Uh oh, see, I tried to rest there and got another random encounter. These random encounters are can be really brutal, too. And you might get guys that can, like, just that one skeleton's no problem. But sometimes you get, like, six guys. <laughs> and you're already, you're just trying to rest. You, and you get attacked by six creatures all, you know, it's, it's pretty much game over at that point. Oh, yeah. So this is a little ongoing story about the, they're trying to join this adventurer's guild. Uh, it's sort of like the party or the, the, the club for professional adventurers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jay has a lot of fun with that in the story. Like, these are just amateur, amateur adventures. Maybe in the next game you can have an indie adventure guild. <laughs> for the adventurers that don't want to fit into the mainstream. Actually, if you play through the game, there's a, there's, there's quite a bit of fun with the story in this adventurers guild and the Silas. Uh, obviously, I won't uh, ruin the surprise ending for you, but it's quite, quite good. It's quite fun when you get to that point. All right, well, let's skip a bit, brother. A little Monty Python reference for you, because I want you to see some of the uh, the story arc here in this uh, first dungeon. Just let me kill this little skeleton. Okay, there we go. Now we're in this uh, torture chamber, and you get to see some of the, the the real fun humor of the game coming up here. I want to show you this. It's really obvious that Jay has played a lot of Dungeons and & Dragons and a lot of RPGs in his time. That comes across in really fun ways. <laughs> So, uh, you know, these uh, characters are pretty well developed, like I said, uh, in the game, but also if, the, if you look at the manuals and stuff that came with it, the PDFs, and you can read more about their, the background. So they put a lot of thought into their their stories. Hopefully there'll be m many more of these games to come and we'll get a, even a better look. So basically the idea is, do we want to let this, this hottie out of the dungeon? Uh, how did she get in there? Can we trust her? You know, should we just do the uh, stereotypical adventurer thing and, uh, <laughs> you know, let her out? <laughs> so I thought it was uh, pretty good. You know, they're playing around a lot with the conventions. I'd love to see more of that all throughout. These uh, conventions can get rather stale, and when a developer decides to turn them on their heads, and some of the best games can result from that. Just thinking of, uh, you know, what they did with uh, Planescape Torment. You know, a lot of that game was just based on undoing uh, one convention was the, the death of the character. You know, reversing what happens and making that a desirable thing to happen. or You know, at least part of the gameplay. And it, you know, pretty much I uh, made a revolutionary game. Oh, I got me a chain shirt! <laughs> now we're totally metal. Uh, you can see armor level 4, minimum might 4, speed negative 2. So I guess there's always a downside. So you put that on, you'll get a little better protection, but you'll be moving slower. Which I don't know if that, I guess that might affect my ability to, to dodge attacks. So that's not good. But maybe I'll absorb a little more damage. Uh, the monsters don't seem to have any problems hitting me. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know what difference it would make. <laughs> I'm look, looking at some of my other inventory. Now unfortunately, although you collect a lot of loot in the dungeons, uh, you can't really do anything with it. Uh, every now and then you'll find an upgrade, but most of it's just replicates. Replicates? Replicates? Is that a word? <laughs> you know, duplicates, there we go, of uh, what you've got already. You can sell it, but, you know, again, there's not much you can do with the cash. So it's, you know, definitely need to work on that part of the game in the sequel. All right, though, so let's uh, move on a little bit. So I want you to see the, some of the later game. And here we return to the lovely village of Arden, where there are some of my favorite creatures. Oh, <laughs> rat tunnels, I'm liking the sound. Oh, there we go! Ha, ha, ha! Tom Rat Lashers! Ah, finally. Get to scratch my rat sling itch. 
Hopefully they won't kill me first. That would be that would be totally terrible, wouldn't it? If the, these rats actually killed me, I think my little part of my soul would die if, if that were to happen. So it's time to break out every spell. Yeah, there we go. Heal them up. Come on. <laughs> Missing. <laughs> That's not realistic at all. Now come on. I can easily, in real life, hit a rat with a spear. <laughs> Next. I think that guy's actually got a dagger. Can you imagine chasing around after rats with a dagger? Oh, throwing some spells. Actually, these, uh, you know, in this game, you'll, you'll use a lot of these damage over time spells like the micro venoms and the, the poisons, the, I think, uh, snake bites one Benjamin has. Because uh, basically, you can throw that on a creature and then you can rest up, but you'll still be doing damage. So I actually use those, those come in quite handy, especially if you throw them on some of the creatures in the back that you're not working on yet. That way, by the time you get to them, they'll be almost dead, and you can just finish them off. Now, one uh, bad thing, I, keep, I hate to keep criticizing this, but a lot of the best spells require these spell stones, and the only way you can get them is to find them. And they're quite rare, so you'll basically be holding on to those, never casting them, saving them for some upcoming super battle that... <laughs> <laughs> then by that time you forget that you got them. Uh, supposedly, I guess, uh, you should be able to buy them somewhere, but uh, never was able to find them. I think there there might actually be some type of glitch in my version of the game, or bug or something, my save, I don't know, but every vendor I went to didn't ever have anything for sale. I could sell things to them, but never got anything back. <laughs> so I think I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be that way. Uh, but nevertheless, I was, I was able to complete the game even without finding those spell stones. But it sure would have been nice to stock up on those things. See, she's got a wand that lets me do that incendiary cracker ball or what, crack ball. I think that's what it's called. Crater ball. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, some of your, you know, area of effect. And I do think. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, these rats have put a hurt on me now. Oh, take that potion. I, 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 this doesn't look good. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, killed by rats. Uh, I think this is probably Jay's way of uh, tormenting me. You know, put the rats in the game and then not, not make my characters powerful enough to kill them. <laughs> oh, oh, what can I do? Microvenom, anything. What I need now is a... Deus, S, Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, I don't think I can cast... I don't think I can resuscitate somebody. Yep. Oh, maybe Chloe. Maybe she'll be able to do this. Oh, it's going to be close. Okay. <laughs> One rat left. She's got full health. Okay. She's got a micro venom on him, I think, so he's going down. Just, just hold it in there, Chloe. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, blurry form. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that'll, that'll help there. Maybe the, he'll miss a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Miss. <laughs> Not so fun when you're the one missing, is it? Okay. Come on, come on, come on. Oh! <laughs> now that's what I'm talking about. Right, right there now. Hanging on by a sliver. All my characters dead. One little Chloe left. But she managed to survive, and now I just got to get back <laughs> back to the end, and I'll be safe and sound and snuggly. That's good. Uh, good role-playing game mechanics right there. You when it, when you get into this uh, every battle, you click, 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 click. You know, there's no real challenge. Eh, who wants that? It's more fun when you really got a stake in it. I'll take a peek in there. <laughs> I guess I should probably rush on to the end. Go ahead and show you the end here so you can see what, what it takes to bring your characters back. Give you a little tour or two of the village of Arden. I serve a little side quest so you can get here. There's one of the houses. There's a, a lady in a negligee standing next to a pipe organ. She's got a saber-toothed tiger that you have to kill. There's also a shopping list. There's a historian back there. This is the, the mayor. <laughs> There's a, a wonderful moment involving that statue in the middle of town there. And it's really worth playing the game just to, to see that part. <laughs> Definitely not going to spoil that, that part for you. Okay, up to the bedroom. And, of course, it would have to be upstairs there. Okay. Oh, that's about the only use I found for money in this game is the, <laughs> the silver for the, for the bed. 
Well, here's where the team really got creative with their dungeon design. I mean, here we have this, the Plains of Anarchy. <laughs> and apparently gravity doesn't quite work as, as it should here. Got this floating uh, manor here. It's really cool. Now, here's the dragon, but as you can see, it's only a paper mache dragon. Fortunately, it's quite tough. I don't know if that's supposed to look small or supposed to be a huge dragon. I <laughs> don't quite know. It still looks cool. It's pretty ferocious. Maybe it's kind of a, a baby paper mache dragon, but... You know, Jay correctly put the dragons towards the end of the game, not at the beginning. Be quite a while before you're up to killing these sons of guns. It's, you can see, even this uh, one by himself has given me quite a quite a workout here. Now, I did manage to find a little exploit all on my own. Quite proud of it, but I'll share it with you. So basically, the melee weapons don't use up your endurance nearly as bad as spells. Unfortunately, Chloe and Benjamin they don't have much strength, so they can't or might. Uh, so they're not able to use some of the better weapons that you find. However, if you cast one of those uh, spell strength enhancement spells on them, uh, then you can equip one of those better weapons, and once the spell wears off, they can still continue to use the weapon. So, <laughs> well, This place is definitely cool. Now, there's a little puzzle that you have to solve to get in here, uh, which made my wife quite delighted. She loves to solve those sort of logic puzzle type things, and this was a really good one. Oh, so this is a, a, a one of the first things you can want to get as soon as possible. There's a little, uh, I don't know if it's a skill or an enhancement, but one of those will let you detect some of the random encounters and avoid them. It works uh, It works quite a bit, too, so you can avoid a lot of the random encounters if you if you want. And you can, you can, if you want to engage them, you can. You have that option, but that's definitely something you want to pick up <laughs> right away as soon as it's available. Just looking in the old logbook here to see if I've got any tips on defeating dragons. No, apparently not. These guys are working a number on me. You'd think it's something made out of paper mache would be quite quite flammable, but I don't know if that's how that works. Maybe I should use the opposite. Oh, things are not looking very good. I think I will uh, move on before I am reduced to toast. <laughs> Show you one of my favorite uh, quests. So here we have a little goblin town uh, in one of these plains of uh, Ares of Anarchy ca caverns. Now this is uh, supposedly a store, and as you can see, uh, this merchant only has for sale stuff that I sold him <laughs> already. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I just, I'm sure there's got to be a bug there. It seemed like he would have something to sell me. Let's see, somewhere around here is a uh, alchemist. Yeah, there he is. Uh, so, <clears throat> there's a little ferret back at the back at the inn, and I found out that I can convert him back into a human if I can get this guy a potion from this guy. So I want to show you that. It, you know, it's pretty cool. I don't know why a ferret would uh, want to make the transformation back into a human. I think being a ferret would be pretty cool myself. But uh, you know, it's not quite as good as a rat, but it's it's pretty close. Okay, so all I have to do is go back down these stairs and be careful not to fall off. <laughs> Actually, I, don't, I guess you can... Some of the, Sometimes you can fall off and sometimes there's a little invisible rail to keep you in. But Yeah, there we go. There's a chest. The 10-foot poles and things like that are good for the rogue. Unfortunately, there were some chests in this game that were just too hard. I never could unlock them. And every time you fail, there's a really high chance of a really nasty random encounter, so <laughs> it puts you off of that pretty quick and you just give up after a while. Oh, here's some goblin champions, and you can see just uh, how much more damage I'm doing to these things in my original party. I think these guys are level 12s by now, so quite a few abilities. I'll just show you some of the spells. So you can see some of the creativity that went into it. Uh, let's see, what is that? The Magnum Inferno... Let's see, somewhere here I have a... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so check that out. Actually throws him through a window. And there's another one that has a, a boot that comes out and kicks him. And I'll show you that one when we get back to Chloe. You know, it's... So many games are just so... They don't have any creativity with the spells at all. You know, okay. Fire spell number one. Fire spell number two. Oh, now it's an uh, ice ray. Uh, big 
flipping deal. Uh, this game actually has quite a bit of creat creativity that went into the spells. Uh, you're kicking people with a giant boot. Uh, you're throwing them out a window. There's another one here that will explode their kneecaps. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I just love that. I like the, except the wacky spells. It kind of reminds me way back in the day if you ever played a game called Enchanter. I think that was a, I think Zork might have had some of that spirit as well. Just really wacky spells. You know, maybe Jake in next next game could work some of that into his into the puzzles and the dungeons. I remember in the was it a Grand Inquisitor? One of those Zork games where you had a spell that would make a purple things turn invisible. I'm like what the hell is that? use of that you know but then there was an infinite corridor and if you look the word the letters i n were purple <laughs> and then once you cast the spell on that it would turn into the finite corridor and then you could go down it you know stuff like that i think would be hilarious to add to this you know okay there we go i think he's going to give me now the uh, uh the potion to turn the ferret boy back that's both of powder uh, you can give me explosive powder, I guess. Might as well stock up on that. <laughs> Finally, yeah, a thousand silver. Yeah, please. I got any other use for it. Oh, and look, I leveled up. It's always a good reason to do quests, right? You get that bonus XP. And you get a couple of those grenades there. Okay. What am I looking for? I forgot what I was doing at this point. I think I wanted to sell some stuff. <laughs> Whoa, what happened there? What the? Okay, I sold them one potion and then became 999. Maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's the thing. I just sell potions, and uh, I get more, give me more things to sell. No, still. Maybe if I sell a different kind of potion, maybe that'll. No, I. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. I got 999 uh, ways to negligibly heal myself. <laughs> Not ideal. I don't know. I just can't figure out what's going on with that. Anyway, let's go find that ferret. So back to the inn. Yeah, I definitely would have liked to have a... There is a spell that will rest you, but there's no way to get... There's no spell to bring you completely back. That would have been cool. Ah, look, the little ferret. Who is this? Kogan Kagan the ferret. Well, oh, look at him. Just jumping up there like that. Now oh, he's free! <laughs> Quite naked man, not pictured. <laughs> I guess that's one way to cut down on <laughs> development costs. <laughs> oh, he's making himself a toga. Hey, you ever wonder what it would like to be a ferret, you know? I love that Sword in the Stone movie by Disney where the Merlin and the Arthur become all the different animals and run around. That'd be a pretty cool concept for a game. Okay, anyway, there you have it, folks. Uh, Frayed Night, Skull of Smackdown, a labor of love. A great game. Had a really fun time with this, despite the little nitpicks. I think you will enjoy it very much if you are a fan of the classic role-playing games of the, I guess, maybe the late 80s, early 90s, that, that sort of era. Uh, if you, you're you going to have a lot of turn-based combats in here, random encounters and things, uh, that, so depends on how you feel about that, but the the writing, the story, the dialogue, the humor is definitely all just uh, at the very top of my list in terms of quality. Very fun. It's always uh, fun to get to watch those interviews, too, with Jay, and then you see how much of his personality is transferred into this. Also, there's uh, quite a bit of mechanics here you can get in and play around with. He knows there's lots of feats and proficiencies and lots of ways to customize these characters. Um, so... I mean, you know, and, and again, this, this can change your strategy. You know, if you like to be a more defensive player, certainly options for that. If you want to be more aggressive, more reckless, you know, the options are here for that. So, all in all, very good stuff. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to seeing the next game in the series, and hope you are too. Anyway, I'll post the links in the show notes to Jay's site where you can buy this game. Let me just check the price of it. So, it's 20 bucks. And it goes the strategy guide. There's also a free demo if you like to play before you buy, so... Highly recommend this. Go get it. Go get yourself a copy. You'll enjoy it. And 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new interview series with Bill Volk, a guy whose roots go all the way back to the very beginning of the industry, so uh, stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very much if you have supported this show in any way, and that includes uh, whether you've donated money. You can do that at armchairarcade.com. As little as a dollar per episode. That's all I ask. And, but also those who help spread the word about the show. If you're on Twitter uh, retweeting uh, the show announcements or on Facebook telling your friends about it or, or posting about uh, relevant shows on blogs or forums, whatever, guys, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Now, what about that ale of the week? Oh, my God, look what I found for this week. I've got a dragon's milk. That seems like I remember doing this one before, so sorry <laughs> if it's a repeat. Uh, it'd be kind of fun to see if my rating has changed on it. But anyway, this is a bourbon barrel stout. It's uh, from the High Gravity series from New Holland Brewing Company. I think that is out of, uh, where is that out of? Stout aged in bourbon barrels. Come on. <laughs> Can't believe they wouldn't say where it was brewed. Oh, there it is. Holland, Michigan. <laughs> Not Holland, uh, uh, the country. Uh, roasty malt character intermingled with deep vanilla tones all dancing in an oak bath. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, well, a character a character with tones dancing in a bath. Okay, pairings. Uh, red meat, smoked foods, uh, balsamic rich cheese, and dark chocolate. I actually think I'll be enjoying this with some jalapeno spam after this, actually. Uh, 23 Plato alcohol, 10% uh, by volume. So that's a pretty... Pretty substantial. Bourbon barrel stout. Well, anyway, let's get this open and see what this dragon's milk is all about. All right, so I got some of this dragon's milk here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, that is a rich aroma on this one. You're getting a lot of, uh, what is that? I guess that's the bourbon, uh, uh, the bourbon scent there. It's, it's kind of a sweet, uh, syrupy, kind of cherry-like uh, quality to it. Maybe a little bit of a, yeah, sort of cherries and blueberries. That's kind of what I'm uh, smelling there. Maybe a little bit of a currant, currant, <laughs> what am I saying, raisins. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it smells very good. Uh, I can tell this is going to be really sweet. So anyway, here's a little toast. Who am I toasting to? Uh, Jay Barnson. Uh, Rampant Coyote, good job on Frayed Nights and really enjoying working with you on the new game. <laughs> Just have to actually get around to designing some dungeons. Uh, maybe this will help. All right. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> oh, well, that dragon's got a bite. <clears throat> okay, that's a very thick, uh, very thick uh, <laughs> ale here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me collect my thoughts on this. Uh, very strong. Uh, uh, it's uh, creamy. Sort of definitely tasting a sort of chocolatey uh, caramel, uh, almost like a malt, chocolate malt like uh, flavor to this. Uh, really, uh, it's very complex. It's uh, like I say, it's very thick. <laughs> well, I, I would not want to see somebody try to chug this. It would probably kill them uh, if they choked to death on it. I mean, it's it's, it's that thick. Uh, Taste-wise, uh, quite good, actually. Um, like I say, you want to take this nice and slow because you definitely taste a lot of alcohol in this. Um, it's almost like drinking a beer with some bourbon <laughs> or bourbon with some beer in it. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, quite um, what is that taste? Again, it's a sort of peanut butter-like taste that you get with some of these. Bit of a coffee. I like flavors. Definitely a really excellent stout. Uh, one of the best stouts I've had. I know I'm kind of uh, going on about it being sort of a kick in the kick in the teeth, I guess, but that's kind of what I look for. You know, you like a manly brew. Uh, here you go, Dragon's Milk uh, Stout. Very manly. <laughs> I think I'm going to go a full uh, five out of five horns on this one, actually. Uh, very tasty. I uh, really like it. And uh, what's better is it's something you can enjoy uh, very slowly uh, so you can get a lot out of that four pack that it comes in. Okay, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I got a quotation from one of my, uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Mark Twain. It goes something like this. Go to heaven for the climate, but go to hell for the company. See you guys next week. This parrot is no more. It has ceased to be. It's expired and gone to
me its maker. <laughs> this is a late parrot. <laughs> it's a stiff, bereft of life. It rests in peace. If you hadn't nailed it to the perch, it would be pushing out the daisies. It's run down the curtain and drawing the choir invisible. This is an ex-parrot. <laughs>